Welcome to the broadcast, everybody. If I get through this broadcast and I'm still alive at the end of it, it's going to be a miracle because of this top. And I picked up this top at a charity shop this week, second hand. I fell in love with it, but there wasn't a size on the label at the top, at the back. So I thought, oh, it kind of looks like it might fit. Then I got it home and tried to wriggle into it and it was so tight. And usually I will pick up a size 12, a British size 12, which is different from sizes abroad. A 12, sometimes even a 14 or something baggy, you know, oversized. But never do I pick up a size 10, which is what this is. I found the size down the side. But I really, really loved it. So I thought I'm going to give it a second go today. And I've squeezed into it. Somehow the buttons have done up. Bear in mind, my dear, I'm over six foot one. I'm just shy of six foot two. So this is designed for a rather more diminutive uh, lady of size 10. And it's a snug fit even for that. So <laughs> I know it's ridiculous that I'm putting it on, but it's got a sort of 90s feel about it that I rather enjoy. I don't know if that's coming across with the velvet black hair. And um, it's rather like a corset. It's actually holding me in and keeping my posture up straight like a corset so I can pretend, can't I, that I'm one of those Edwardian ladies or some such artefact from history. But enough about me. It's time to hear about His Majesty because he has emerged for Sunday service at Clathy Kirk. Yes, he is back on the Sandringham Estate, of course. The first time that he's been seen since we saw him discharged from the London Clinic. He was accompanied by the Queen, who was wearing that scrumptious hat of hers. Love it. And His Majesty waved to well-wishers. And he's been recuperating at home, as you know, after his three-night stay at the clinic. And he was wearing his brown overcoat and holding an umbrella. And he was then accompanied by Reverend Williams to the service. King Charles has also just appointed the first ever female equerry to a sovereign. There have been female equerries before. In fact, the Duke of York employed two of them. In the years before, he stopped working as an official royal in 2019. And as Prince of Wales, Charles did appoint RAF squadron leader Jane Casebury back in 2006, so rather a while ago but never before for a sovereign. And in this circumstance, it's Captain Cat. We've got a Captain Cat, my dear. Miss Cat Anderson, at the age of 33, is an officer with the Royal Artillery, and she has the great honour of becoming an assistant equerry, and she is going to be helping with diaries and overseeing official engagements, and she's going to accompany various royals on their tours and with their duties, and she will help advise on matters military with all her expertise and experience. And she also worked for a while for the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. She began last month in earnest, actually, on secondment from the Cabinet Office in Number 10, and she was Private Secretary to the National Security Advisers and as the Prime Minister's aide-de-camp. She is of mixed Malaysian heritage, and she joins Captain Hugh Scrope of the Coldstream Guards, who is the King's other assistant private secretary, and both of them will deputise for Lieutenant Commander Will Thornton, who was also appointed, if you remember, as the King's new equerry, and he is the one that replaced Johnny, our dear Johnny Thompson, who never fear, became a senior equerry, which is more of an executive position than the job we've been used to seeing him over the last couple of years. So I'm afraid he will become rather more less visible, although I'm sure he'll be popping up occasionally. Speaking of which, poor old Johnny. I'm going to start calling him Bonnie Johnny, by the way, because I used to enjoy calling him Major Johnny. It had such import. But I get bored of that tongue twister of Lieutenant Colonel Thompson and all of that. So I'm just going to call him Bonnie Johnny because he is a bonnie boy, isn't he? He's a bonnie boy. Well, poor old Bonnie Johnny was captured by the Paps. Yes, he was. At last, after a year of wooing his new beau, they have been captured for the first time. And we are presented with Olivia Lewis. Liv Lewis, a 33-year-old PR executive, this is the first photograph of them together, to the best of my knowledge. But as I say, the relationship is a year in, and I wouldn't normally cover this. I've never covered a drop of uh, Johnny's 
private life as much as people have asked me to, and now you know the reason for it and why I never referred to his wife. Now you know the reason for it, my dear, but the reason that I am allowing myself to hold forth today is because it's splashed over all the newspapers here. So the chances are you've probably already heard about it or will do in the future anyway, so it makes not a blind bit of difference what I gossip to you about. But Olivia's father, uh, Simon, worked with the late Queen, actually, as Director of Communications. So she has form within the royal household via him and also via her. She met Johnny via her association with Charles and Camilla. And uh, notably, her father advised the late Queen in the aftermath period following Diana's demise. And also, his brother, William, who is Liv's uncle, Will, is the publisher and the chief executive of the Washington Post. Who would have thunk it? And he used to actually publish the Wall Street Journal. And he was once editor of the Daily Telegraph. But as you know, I keep my counsel when it comes to the Thompsons and Bonnie Johnny. Uh, as you might recall, he knows this channel. It came to his attention through a certain video that I made, a video montage, which also brought the channel to the attention of many members of the royal household. So we've discussed that before. We won't go over old ground, but I keep my counsel in certain quarters, my dear. Discretion is key. But as for the indiscreet among us, we have the subject of Meghan the Duchess of Sussex, and a new tome by Ingrid Seward, who is an author and an editor of Majesty magazine. Some of you might be familiar with Majesty. Well, she's come out with a book, and she tells us that Prince Philip, the late Duke, had a nickname for Meghan. <laughs> and this is a rather delicious one, because the, the nickname was born in relation to her perceived similarity to the Duchess of Windsor, dear Wallace Simpson. Now, before we go any further, there are negative connotations associated with dear Bessie Wallace, but let me say now, as I have said before, and will say again, that yes, there are similarities, but Bessie Wallace Simpson was also glamorous, truly elegant and truly chic, stylish, and also was a lady and a fabulous hostess and all kinds of things that do not apply to the Duchess of Sussex, so let's not get it twisted, love a girl. But on the fuzzy end of the lollipop, <laughs> there are some humorous elements to both her look and her the repercussions of her relationship with Edward or David, however you want to put it, my dear but their relationship of the Windsors that might apply to the Sussexes as well. Um, but that is what Prince Philip intuited, regardless. Uh, many comparisons have been drawn all over the internet, as you might have seen ad infinitum, my dear. But the nickname was D.O.W. Prince Philip used to call her D.O.W., according to Ingrid Seard, uh, meaning the Duchess of Windsor. She doesn't say whether he used to say, spell it out, D-O-W, or used to say, Dow. But I rather like the idea of him calling her Dow, because then we can call her Dowdy, can't we, my dear? Ha <laughs> ha! The Dowdy Duchess. How marvellous, how magnificent. Oh, old Dowdy. Megsy Pegsy. Ingrid Seward says that Prince Philip was one of the very few succumbing to her charm offensive because most people in the family, including the late Queen, she says, were very highly prepared to give her a go, see what this girl's all about, and rather taken with the girl, you know, initially, you know, seeing the good in people. And, well, that makes sense that Prince Philip didn't fall for her hooker, line and sinker, because Prince Philip was a handsome young man, very handsome, not to my personal taste, too skinny. But he was a handsome man and he had a twinkle and a winkle and the girls loved it and the girls uh, fell at his feet. He was uh, charisma personified, very masculine and uh, they dropped and wilted, you know, in his presence and they were all over him trying to get to him. Well, when you have that effect on ladies, you become hardened to their charms. You know, you can recognise, enjoy a beautiful woman, but you also can have an instinct about what they're really trying to get at. And the batting of the eyelids has been seen a million times, you understand. 
the batting of the eyelids, the games, what's known as feminine wiles, my dear. You ladies know what I'm talking about here. You know, we can all switch that on, can't we, my darling? And make a man feel a million bucks. Ah, you're so, <laughs> you're hilarious. <laughs> you're just so darn funny. Yawnsville, Yawnsville. Yeah, no, we can all do that, darling, and make nice and pout and fatter. Well, Philip saw through it. Philip saw through her, Philip, and wasn't impressed. On the fuzzy end of the lollipop, you have the likes of Harry. And we know the likes of Harry, who wouldn't naturally have ladies falling at his feet, unless it's to do with matters royal in his title and his position. And that's not to say that there was anything ever beastly about him, or wrong, or even downright unattractive. It's merely to say that as an average man, as a mediocre man. Again, nothing wrong with being average or mediocre. But in that vein, they are the type that are more susceptible to the charms of women. These are the types who might purr over flattery, flatteries of interest and uh, take them seriously and think they really mean it. Do you see? So we can certainly understand why the late Duke of Edinburgh you can just see him standing back and looking at him and thinking, hmm, yes. Bessie Wallace too, especially with that hairdo. <laughs> well, there were physical similarities to begin with. Rather pale complexion, very dark hair, uh, slim, very, very slim. Ingrid Seward says they were both glamorous divorcees. I would find it a stretch to use the adjective glamorous for Megan. In fact, I personally wouldn't use it, but each to their own, but yes. She was a divorcee. But of course, the late Queen's mother, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, blamed Bessie Wallace Simpson for the early death of her husband, King George VI. So there were dark connotations to drawing a comparison between Dowdy and the Duchess of Windsor. She continues, while the Queen continued to champion Harry's new love, Philip warned his wife to be cautious it was uncanny, he told her, how much Meghan reminded him of the Duchess of Windsor. <laughs> and in fairness to Meghan, I will point out that those similarities might also include a general feeling of convivial hospitality, what's the word I'm looking for, convivial enthusiasm that is often associated with Americans and the energy that they give off. So there could have been some positive connotations tangled up in there with the not so positive. However, the late Lady Elizabeth Anson spoke with Ingrid Seward before she died a few years ago and Lady Elizabeth, known as Liza actually, was uh, a cousin of the late Queen Elizabeth and her mother, this was through her mother's side, her mother was a Beaux Lion you see, and she was also sister to the Earl of Lichfield. Some of you might remember Patrick, the famous sort of society photographer amongst other endeavors. But Ingrid Seward claims that Lady Elizabeth told her that the Queen only made one remark to her about the Sussex wedding. Um, when she doesn't say much, but when she does, it says it all, doesn't it, my dears? What she told her was that the wedding gown was too white it was too white. See, it was never about her being too black, my dear. She was too white. <laughs> the gown was too white, blindingly white. I suppose she had a point, didn't she? Apparently she said, in, in other words, that it's not appropriate for a divorcee getting married in church to look quite so flamboyantly virginal. <laughs> and we also hear tell that the late Queen was not comfortable with Prince Charles, as he was, standing in for Thomas Markle Senior for the Isle Parade. She didn't approve of that. She didn't like it, didn't think it was cricket. And in hindsight, it's hard not to agree with her, isn't it? She didn't approve either of her own husband, of Prince Philip, hobbling down the aisle without crutches because he'd recently had his hips done. He'd had a hip replacement. But you know what Prince Philip was like, stubborn and determined, and he managed fine. But she wanted to err on the side of caution. 
Another thing we are told is that the late Queen was startled, <laughs> I think we all were, my dear, by Archbishop Preacher Michael Curry. Remember him? Oh, it went on and on and on, didn't it? And then it became a farce. Uh, he spoke for almost a quarter of an hour at the service. Uh, it was the longest sermon in Christendom, it felt like at the time, didn't it, my dear? Well, apparently they were startled by that. Well, we all were. Rather uncomfortable, it really was. The Gospel Choir, a great success. I believe that was actually on Charles's advice, or he curated uh, the singers, the orchestra, because he'd known and enjoyed them so much. And that brought some wonderful new flavour to the ceremony and the proceedings. But that preacher, you know, I'm sure he's a lovely man, but ooh, it did have you sort of hiding behind your own veil in the pews, didn't it, my dear? Thinking, please end, please end, please end, or changing channels. But Lady Elizabeth also disclosed the fact that the Queen, the late Queen, was dismayed by Harry's high-handed attitude which is something we only spoke about in, yesterday in the previous broadcast. And his attitude with William, of being all high-handed and high and mighty. His high-handed attitude before and after the wedding and their relationship was quite badly damaged by it all. And she also brings up the fact that we all know about, because Harry told us about it in spare, when he wanted to wear his beard for the wedding because he felt hideous without it. And William had not been allowed to wear a beard for the wedding. He was not given permission by the late Queen, so he had to get it done. He went to Granny and asked special favour. And of course, uh, she didn't want to be a complete nut of Harridan, but said yes. But the intimation is that it wasn't considered the done thing, but he went ahead and did it anyway and liked to rub salt in William's wound there and said, well, look, I get to have a great big bushy masculine beard and you were all bald. <laughs> so there was that comparison being made. That gets brought up. But yes, these are words from Lady Elizabeth. We are told, the late Queen's cousin, that he was high-handed and... Uh, that the relationship was damaged you know he tells us he was granny's favorite up to a point you know she always loved the boy but it seems that she was highly disappointed with his behavior if what we are told is to be believed and in fairness i will say let us remember that all of these three we're talking about here elizabeth philip and lady elizabeth anson they've all kicked the bucket now my dear so they're not here to rebuff or defend themselves not that the late queen would never complain never explain but as for Lady Elizabeth, well, she can't sue anybody unless she's going to come back as the ghost of Lady Elizabeth. You know, one can't be sued by a ghost, can one? So Ingrid Seward is treading on safer ground than she would have done if she were fabricating while they were alive. So we have to bear these things in mind because no matter if we're hearing good things, bad things, amusing things, funny things, I see far too much of people just accepting exactly what they're told as if it is fact and it is not and just as i would encourage you not to simply assume that everything that i tell you is spot on and entirely accurate i would suggest that for one and all in any circumstance whoever you are talking to so i just make that point for what it's worth the late queen made the decision not to worry about it eventually and uh, this was because he only listened to his wife and he wasn't going to listen to anyone else. <laughs> well, that is typical of Queen Elizabeth, isn't it, my dear? There were times when I would say that she indulged in a bit of ostriching, and I say it with affection, but she did put her head in the sand uh, on many, many occasions. And I'm afraid sometimes it did have catastrophic results, but in other areas and in other ways, it was a way for her to conserve her energy and put it where it was going to be life enhancing instead of a great big waste of fucking time. I would like to extend my congratulations to the fruits of Malaysia who watch this broadcast because I know there are a few of you. Congratulations on your new king. It was interesting to hear about him. Sultan Ibrahim Iskander of Johor. I'm ignorant really about your monarchy but I've been reading up on it and it's interesting. There was an oath-taking ceremony at the palace at Kuala Lumpur, and the new king is a half-British billionaire. 
He's worth six, seven billion, a conservative estimate, so a lot of money. You know, I never wanted anything to do, I've got to tell you, with the money of any partner of mine, of any companion of mine. I've never been one of those who looked for, you know, a tycoon or a man of great land and property and wealth. It never was going to behoove me or my character to, to set myself up with somebody uh, with a lot of money because personally I know that I wouldn't get a single moment's pleasure from spending somebody else's money and being a lady of leisure in that way or a lady boy of pleasure, whatever you want to call it, my dear, you understand. It's, it's not my thing. Uh, I don't find the idea of living off of someone else's or their own or their family money. I don't find it enriching or life enhancing at all or satisfying in any way. I like to earn my own crust and then it's more delicious uh, to save and spend. Um, so mil millionaires have never, uh, you know, have not been fussed about them. But I will confess to you, my dear, that sometimes I have rather pondered on what it might be like to be the beau of a billionaire. Not so much for the material possibilities of that and the mercenary possibilities, but just because it's a different realm, isn't it? It is a different realm altogether when you're talking about somebody with, you know, five or six billion or tens of billion, a completely different vast amount of sums and the diva in me would like to experience it or wouldn't have minded trying it. It would have been like, one can imagine like Elsa in Frozen when she acquires new magic powers and she sends a jolt here and an icicle there and things form all around her in a gown. You know, in my imagination, it's rather like that. In reality, it's probably rather boring, but it must be nice to have everything at your disposal. Disposal when money isn't even a question, you know, as it might be for, you know, the odd millionaire. It's not even a question. But before I go on and sound a bit too much like Rachel Ragland, back to the new king whose British mother, Mummy Dearest, met her royal husband, the prince at that time, at a supper in Torquay. And Torquay is a seaside town here in Devon, at the south of the country. It's known as the English Riviera because it enjoys better weather if you find hotter climate, better weather than the rest of the UK. Um, it can be a really gorgeous place. Devon is beautiful, absolutely stunning coastline and scenery of people and villages. Really, really gorgeous. Torquay, I went to as a toddler really, and I've got very happy memories of it, I've got to say. But then I did go back a couple of years ago, and I do apologize if you're from the area, I do not mean to offend you, but I do believe that the area has been neglected. It had lost its charm, and you know, those old seaside ch towns can be rather attractive, but I'm afraid it was very unappealing to me. You know, it was a Victorian seaside resort, and now, Faulty Towers was set there. You know, the series Faulty Towers, that was set there. Well, one can imagine that very much now. Once you're there, perhaps there are some hidden hidden gems in the area. But young Josephine, as she was, was an art student. And she was in the area at the time. And she married the prince 10 months after meeting him at that supper in Torquay. And this was to the dismay of his countrymen, who were very conservative. They had four children together and the new king, Ibrahim, was actually the third child, but then they separated six years later and divorced, so it was a short-lived marriage. And what I've discovered is that the Malaysian royal throne is actually rather unique. I didn't know this, so I'm sharing it with you. It is not inherited as such in the same way that our throne here is, it rotates every five years between the heads of Malaysia's royal families, and there are nine of them. There are nine royal families. It's on rotation, a royal carousel, if you will. Isn't that something to tickle you? In fact, the new king's father served as king back in the 80s for his tenureship, and then the carousel revolved. The role is symbolic and ceremonial. It's about entertaining dignitaries and hosting them. And it's about dealing with government ministers and swearing them in, that sort of thing. But the crown of Malaysia is enjoying more power now than at any time in history, actually. 
And the new king is a very, very colourful character. He sounds slightly eccentric, as well as being a businessman, a billionaire worth six billion plus. He is an ex-soldier and he has his own private army. He's got a fleet of over 300 luxury cars and he's also made headlines for accumulating over 5k in traffic fines. So he's a naughty boy, but eventually he paid that off. And he says that he's going to be a man of the people, no matter his privilege. And like Britain, Malaysia is a parliamentary democracy. It's governed by a cabinet led by a prime minister whose head of state is a king. So I found it rather interesting to hear about some of the similarities and the differences there. And I would like actually to give a little shout out to some of the Malaysian viewers, the basketeers that I remember. And do forgive me if I don't give you a shout out here at all. Two of you sent me a tip jar treat actually, and they were Anna J. Chung and Narelle Asya Ken Abdullah. And I'd also like to give honorable mentions to Judy Chan, Poppy, Ria Ma, Morgan Juban, Shari Mohammed, Lily N, Joseph Ormerud, Farah Zahida, Willie Watercolour Studio, and Jennifer Tso. Thank you for the times that you've dropped in to lend your voice. Even though there might be fewer of you obviously here than some of the other nations, I see you and I hear you. And I thank you very much for your input. It's really lovely to have you here. Her Royal Highness, Princess Beatrice, made an appearance at Poppy Delavine's Della Vita Valentine's lunch at the Ivy Chelsea Garden. And I love this head girl off duty vibe she's serving. I really like it actually. Sort of semi thrumpy, semi chic. She was wearing Zara on the soft knit that you see in Grey Marl and on the wool blend midi. And to the toes, she wore Gucci loafers in black velvet. They love Gucci, those girls on the feet, especially Beatrice. And Poppy and her sister Cara Delevingne and Chloe Delevingne, the three sisters, founded the vegan range of Proseccos called Delevita. And their mother, Pandora, schooled with Fergie. They're actually still close charms. So their daughters share a bond. It's all in the family. And Pixie Geldof was there. Dean Piper was there and that was interesting to hear about him. He is, and it's interesting that he was with Beatrice because he is a former journalist for The Mirror, including during the times when it was accused of phone hacking. And that I saw a video of him on YouTube, a recent one from a month ago being interviewed. Uh, when, when I read this about his attendance, I did a bit of searching. There was an interview of him that he gave about this. And he was saying what I said in a broadcast quite a while ago when I said I can I can actually believe that Harry was hacked as many others were and there are a lot of denials coming from the likes of Piers Morgan about what they knew and what they didn't and I'm not casting aspersions but what I did say is that there are certain things that Omid Scobie said that ring true to me especially about for example Kylie Minogue's voicemail getting hacked and I went into detail back then I'm not going to rehash it but yes things were sinister to me and he backed up uh, my some of my inclinations on this he said we know what they did and knew their exclusives were coming from the phones apparently there were different mobile phones all over the desks when he was working at the daily mirror he didn't get involved this this dean chap this dean piper he didn't get involved in any of that he says his hands are clean but they all knew what was going on Remember, it was also back in the early 2000s, a different era when it came to social media, people speaking out, piping up and blowing the whistle. There was still the internet, you could still uh, chat along those lines, but not as it is today. You know that, my dear, with the immediacy of social media when everything comes ablaze. So it was a bit different. And he says, we didn't openly talk about it, but everybody knew that it was going on. Everybody knew that it was going on. And he raises an eyebrow about Piers Morgan's claims that he didn't know what was going on because he says that Piers Morgan was editor and he says that he would have asked when these shocking stories came in, he would have asked for the source. He says there's no way that he wouldn't have known because he would have asked and checked for the source. Well, that's what he says. Not what I'm saying for legal reasons. I will make that clear. That's what he's saying. He said he made that point and he says that Piers Morgan was in fact very supportive and a great boss. 
he really sings his praises, but then he did go in and he says he finds it quite amusing that Piers Morgan didn't ask where stories come from. And he says that the legal department there, according to him, he says they certainly knew that the phone hacking and unlawful information gathering was going on. They certainly knew because they're always being called down. They have, you know, a legal department, a team that, that are there to chaperone the staff through these stories and make sure everything's legally watertight. How, I'm not quite sure, and how it was ever acceptable in this company to openly use those kind of tactics. It's rather shocking, isn't it? public figures as well as royalty and anybody else. You know, everybody should be afforded to the dignity of privacy. I really do believe that. But Dean Piper does say that endless amounts, endless amounts came from unlawful info gathering. And he gave an example actually of a Coronation Street actress, not the Nikki Sanderson that was caught up in Harry's cases or similar cases to Harry and lost, but one called Tracy Shaw, he said, who used to be in Coronation Street. And he spoke because he said that was one time that really rattled his cage because he was asked, according to him, not to me, he was asked to deliver a bouquet to her when he spent an evening with her at a, at a hotel, a similar hotel, uh, to deliver a bouquet that was bugged. It was bugged. And his job was to be in the next room or chambers to her in the hotel, listen to what was going on with all the gossip in her private life at that time, in her hotel room, in a bouquet, you know, this kind of espionage. It's not cricket, and I don't like to think of it as being British. Obviously it is, or at least was, but hideous to think about. And as you know, I'm very fond of Princess Beatrice, but she does cosy up to them all, doesn't she? And I don't think it's anything sinister, I just think that there is a sense of vulnerability about the girl, perhaps a naivety, but I wouldn't want to take it from her. But you do see her cozying up and hugging up with Piers Morgan outside pubs and now with Dean Piper, the ex-Mirror journalist. I'm not saying she's not entitled to fun and I'm not saying that she's a working member of the royal family. She isn't. I'm just saying I wouldn't like to see her taken advantage of. But another royal who will never be taken advantage of is the Princess Royal, Anne who was at Gordonston, the school that was attended by King Charles as a boy, and also Prince Philip, who was one of the school's first pupils. Anne opened one of the greenest classrooms in the kingdom, and it's been named in honour of her late mother. Here are the Queen Elizabeth II rooms, and a plaque was unveiled for the occasion. These feature solar panels, ground source heating, CO2 monitoring, and it's clad with large timber and it looks rather hideous to me in the design but what can you say um uh, i'm going to digress aren't i but it just it does make me think about charmless britain this is all very good by the way it's wonderful it's all green and it's all eco-friendly and it's fabulous but oh it looks so ugly and you know i can't stop whinging about the state of british architecture uh, because it just withers doesn't it in comparison to all the old stuff we're very very fortunate enough to in the kingdom to have so much stuff that still survives post-war. Great swathes of it were destroyed in the Blitz and the war, but somehow we've still ended up with dozens of absolutely stunning preserved cities and architecture from more recent centuries, albeit, but you know, it really is a lesson in design. And that is why I'm a great big fan of the King's Poundbury enterprise because even though it felt a bit soulless uh, and these are this is the town that he created himself his own idea to base it upon old traditional architectures and inspiration yes it did have a soulless feel to begin with yes everybody mocked it as looking like a model village but a few years in it has become a booming town a very desirable town uh, with well thought out community life and it is beginning to develop a sense of a soul, from what I hear tell. Because of course, when you make these things from scratch, uh, all at once and quickly, it's not going to have the same sort of charm as, you know, a Bath or a York town centre. Uh, and many of our old cities, of course, it's not going to. But it's going to age a hell of a lot better than the soulless little matchbox estates you see going round. Uh, that are hideous and a blight on the landscape and everything they build in high streets now is absolutely hideous. Charmless, charmless. 
and I digress because it reminds me of one of my first schools that I went to. It had an old building and a new building and the old building was just two little classrooms. It was the original school. That was the original school, just two classrooms, you know, from hundreds of years ago. And utterly, always freezing, I've got to tell you, they were always freezing they were, but high ceilings, beautiful brickwork, and you felt special in them. And then there was a new building, which was not quite so charming, but it was still fairly pleasant. Well, in recent years, uh, when I drive past and see it, there was a huge, great big sort of monolith of a new ugly building and sports centre that they've piled on top of it and you can see the three stages of its development and it's just you know gone from something beautiful and full of charm to something sort of mediocre and then you finish up with this disastrous soulless cage and it just makes me pity everyone in the kingdom and in the world and I don't see why I don't see why I know it's to do with health and safety features and probably budgets and this kind of thing but whatever we're saving, we are losing, my dear, we are losing. They did it so much better in the olden golden days, no doubt. I think that if I was queen or king or prime minister or president, I would make it law, my dear. I would make it law to use the old ways and the old architectural designs. There is a place for modern design, but it should still pass a beauty test, in my opinion. But back to Anne, and doesn't the purple scarf look splendid next to the tartan? Tartan furnishing creates an instant cosy atmosphere, don't you find, my dear? And I loved seeing it here. Anne is also a warden of the school, and she said she's deeply honoured to be a part of it, and that the new facilities captured the spirit and tradition of the school. Well, that's enough waffle from me, my dears. I will allow you to go and enjoy your Sunday. Thank you if you hung on to the bitter end. It was very sweet of you. I've hung on to the bitter end. I haven't died. I haven't collapsed. And actually, this has become a little bit more comfortable as I've been sitting here. Perhaps it's the fabric might be giving a little bit. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed the outfit. I really enjoyed wearing it. I think I like showing off a bit of flesh here. Thanks to those of you who might leave a juicy comment or send me a nice fruity tip jar treat. I thank you most sincerely and I will see you next time. Take care and toodle pip.